Basics with Claire Duff. This video is all about the Baroque bow and how the violin bow evolved over time. In the previous video, we looked in some detail at the 17th century Baroque violin bow. Here it is with its clip-in frog. It's small and light and is perfect for dance music and the fast ornamental passages or diminutions at the, for the music of that time. By the end of the 17th century, um, musicians in Italy wanted to produce a more singing and lyrical sound from their instrument. Composers and violinists believed that the violin's highest goal was to imitate the human voice and the bow was viewed as the soul of the instrument. So it was only natural that longer bows began to be made in order to allow the violin to sing out the longer lines of a Corelli adagio, for example. Because these bows are just so short, it's hard to sustain and do very, very long bows. So here is the 18th century bow, which you can see is longer than the 17th century bow. They are both still have the lovely swan head tips. Um, you can see that they are both convex. The 17th century one is a bit more arched like a bow and arrow. The 18th century one is getting a little bit straighter. The 18th century one has more hair and more wood, so it's heavier, but it's still not as heavy as a modern bow. If we compare the Brock bow to the modern bow, we can see the modern bow is longer, the wood is thicker, there's more hair in the modern bow. Also, the shape is still very, very different. So the shape of a modern bow is concave. It's kind of caving in the middle. And if you look at the tip, we have the swan head tip of the Baroque bow, where it's very light at the tip. Here, we've got more wood at the tip, and we also have this right angle between the wood and the hair. We have this sort of hatchet head style. So this modern bow is designed to sustain the sound throughout. This 18th century bow or sonata bow is perfect for 18th century Baroque music because you can really lean in with this bow with the weight in for the important harmonies, the distance, the suspensions, but you can also release for the resolutions of the harmony or for the unimportant notes. So you can do a lot of subtle shaping with this. Arcangelo Corelli used to say, listen to my bow, can you hear it speaking? So this bow is not only designed for singing, it's also designed for speaking. So I'm now going to play some 17th century music, some music by Schmelzer, and I will first play it with the modern bow. Now I'm going to play it with the 17th century bow. You could probably hear that it's a lot clearer and cleaner with this little bow. Even picking up this 17th century bow after holding the modern bow, it feels so light, especially at the tip, it kind of almost wants to fly off. So it suits this kind of skittish uh, passage work in the Schmelzer. I'll play another bit from this movement. Again, first with the modern bow. possible with a modern bow. Let's try it with the 17th century bow. because it's so short and light. So string crossings are very, very easy and it's easy to remain clear um, with this little bow. I'll play now um, some 18th century music with the 18th century bow. So it's longer, a little bit heavier. So the sound will be a bit more full than the 17th century bow. I'll play 
a little bit of the Jacques de la Guerre. So I can sing longer lines with this uh, bow. Just um, if I play the very last note with the French ornament with a modern bow, I can of course do a dim within the bow as well, but it's not quite as natural as with this 18th century bow where it lightens. So it almost naturally, the bow shape helps you to do this dim within the one stroke. The modern bow, because it stays quite heavy all the way up to the tip, you almost want to continue. You almost want to continue singing the line because of this weight at the tip. So, as we've mentioned before, um, there's a sort of inequality within a Baroque bow. It feels heavier at the heel and lighter at the tip. And it was important for violinists in the Baroque period to bring out the differences between strong beats and weak beats, especially if you're accompanying dancers. So let's say you're playing a triple dance, you want to bring out this strong, light, light, strong, light, light, and therefore you'd make sure you're on a down bow on the strong beats, down, up, up, down, up, up. Also, musicians in the Baroque period saw themselves as orators. They believed that they needed to persuade and move their audience, just as an orator does when delivering a powerful speech. Indeed, they studied the art of rhetoric in school. So, um, when you're speaking, there are words that are more emphatic and important, and there are words that are also less important. Um, so we don't speak in a sustained monotone way with every word being equally important. Um, within paragraphs there are sentences that are more important, within sentences there are more important and less important words, and even within one word there are more important and less important syllables, there are subtle inflections such as mamma mia. So to bring a language to life and to really speak uh, a language and speak the music you need uh, subtle differences in colour, nuances, inflections, phrasing, shaping, and this is all very easy to do in a Baroque bow. During the classical and romantic periods, large concert halls were built, and so there was an increasing need for more projection from the instrument of the violin. Bows became heavier, longer, and they got more hair. And the style of music was moving towards much more sustained and longer phrases and also technical virtuosity. Um, so there was an increasing desire to sustain throughout the phrase and therefore violinists wanted a more even distribution of weight from the frog to the tip. So along came changes to this bow, um, such as the transition bow. If you see it at first you might think it's uh, a modern bow but it is certainly heading that way. It is still, if I compare it to a modern bow, um, it's still a little bit shorter, there's still a little less hair, a little less wood, so it's lighter. Um, and you can see the head is just in between a swan head and a hatchet head. So this transition bow is perfect for Mozart and Haydn where you want to sing longer phrases, maybe sustain a bit more, but you still also want to be able to bring out subtle nuances and articulation. It wasn't until the turn of the 19th century when Francois Tourt invented his model of bow that the real, the modern bow was really born. Um, the Tourt bow is ideal for 19th century music um, and any music onwards beyond that. Um, and so most modern bows are based on the tort model.
If we have a look at the torque model modern bow, we can see at the bottom there's some metal going across here, which is called a ferrule. And this was designed in order to be allowed to have even more hair on the bow without any danger of it getting bunched up. So I'm now going to play some Mozart with uh, the classical transition bow and also with my classical violin. So for me this is the perfect bow for this type of music because it can really sing out uh, but it's also quite uh, subtle. Um, now I'm going to play some Brook um, 19th century music but I'm going to first attempt to play it on a 17th century Brook bow. So the opening of the Brook Violin Concerto. possible to do. Let's try it with the modern bow. So it's so much more satisfying playing Brook with the right bow. Uh, there's a rich, powerful sound um, you can sustain it, you just don't need to work as hard. Um, so just as you're at a disadvantage playing 19th century music with a 17th century Baroque bow, I believe you can be at a disadvantage playing Baroque music, 17th and 18th century music, with a 19th century or 20th century bow. Um, there are so many things that are easier with the Baroque bow for Baroque music. Also just the string crossing and the speed of uh, articulation and attack, um, just like uh, some Bach. That's with the modern bow. Then with the 18th century bow. Both are indeed possible, but I enjoy uh, the Baroque bow more for that music because there's a little spring in its step as it does all the string crossings um, and I find it easier to bring out the dance-like quality of a lot of rock music. So I'm going to end the video today by showing a chart, a little summary I've made to show the differences between a modern bow and a rock bow. <laughs>